Ladies and gentlemen, welcome everyone to this brand new series, Tom and Furs, Did You Know? Today, we're going to go through our favorite features on the SD series, which you will guess enhance your workflow. In the blue corner, we have myself, and in the red corner, we have the one and the only, can you hear those drums, Fernando Delgado. How's Thank it going over there, Fernando? Thank you very much for the introduction, Tom. That's Everything quite okay. Okay, the... th yeah. and thanks more, everybody. <laughs> How's it going? It's going great. Really good there. You, got your yeah, you can see I'm in, in the magic room and surrounded of wicked things and loving it. So it's going to be it's great. Very, very much at home. What, uh, what's the setup then for today? How are we going to be uh, showing the content, so to speak? What have you got well, uh, you see, for example, that uh, oh, you got a camera that's pointing at me and we're going to be able to show things on the surface as we work. We're going to have also a closer view with a bit more uh, resolution for the guys who want to see the parameters and all. And, course, yeah. Then, yeah. Yeah. and then we have a little helper here, which I'm going to be moving about when I need. So I nice pretty much can cover everything, I think. Yes. Good stuff. I'm sure that thing has seen some action. Now, we wouldn't be able to do this all by ourselves. We have Dan and Molly, who are also assisting, pulling the screens in the background. Hello, Dan and Molly. How are things? How are you doing? What are you up to? All good. Yep. Sitting here watching the stream, ready to answer your questions and uh, help as needed. Yeah. All good. Smashing, smashing. So, yeah, please feel free to write uh, any questions that come up into your mind. Uh, we'll do our best to answer them as we're going through the content. Now, one last thing before we begin. Uh, we are at the mercy of our friendly neighborhood internet connection. So if for any reason it does go down, we will obviously endeavor to get this back up and running. Please subscribe onto the YouTube channel so you don't miss any of the new stream if we do have to reset everything as, as uh, we, we might have to do. Hopefully we won't. But, um, but yeah, so before further ado, let's crack on. So our first favorite thing, the option all button. Probably the most overlooked feature that really speeds workflow. So you can control multiple parameters simultaneously, break gangs, include, exclude certain channels from a whole option all control. The list is pretty long. Especially useful in multi channels as well, but uh, but without me saying all the information, Fernando, show us uh, what we can do with the option all, please. Well, Tom, thanks, because it's actually one of my favorite buttons, you know, because uh, there's so much you can do with it. So let me show you, for example, I'm going to switch to my overview uh, camera. So the option all button, it's right there. Okay, you can find it in any surface. Mm -hmm. So when I press that button, I can do two things. I can press and hold, or I can just press it once. And it behaves differently. So let me show you, for example, when I leave that button pressed, it will link all the channels in my bank, as you yep. can see, keeping the offsets. So it's great. And also, you can notice it's not moving my channel number one, because that is a different kind of channel. So the system realizes that there is a different channel. I'm not going to link it. So that's great. It's a very quick way to link anything within those channels. Now, I don't have to link all of them, Tom. So let me show you with my little helper here. Mm -hmm. Okay. That if I press the option all button, which you can see there, option all, Yep. You will see that all my LCDs will show the word include, or if I press something, it will say exclude. exclude. Yeah. Exactly. So I can tell the system what parameters or channels will be linked temporarily for that particular function. So if I go like that, all of them are linked. If yep, I absolutely. exclude those four, for example, you can see they're not linked anymore. So it's great. I really like that option as well, especially if you've got, say, your, your three toms or something and you just want to affect like a high pass filter setting across all three mics, just exclude the rest of the channels on your on your drum bank, for example, and then you can just control those three microphones. So, exactly. yeah, I think it works really well. Offline software wise, you can still, do the same Tom, function, can't you? It's still one thing I want to point out because oh, we've yeah. seen that it actually links all the channels. But what I really like is that the button does the opposite when there are existing links. So let me show you that. I'm going to go back to my multi-channel, OK? Actually, you might be able to see a, that a little bit better here on my offline. I've got a multi-channel here, OK? Which 
when I unfold it, shows that every parameter is linked, okay? So if I touch anything on any of the channels, you can see it's linking all of them. Yes. Yep. So now that button, the optional, because it detects there is a gang, it will do the opposite without me having to go into, into any menu. That's what I like. I just press it once. I don't have to hold it. And that isolates one channel from the others, as you can see. So I'm not affecting the other channels. I'm just affecting the one I'm in, and I can then switch it off and back to my link, as you can see, keeping the offset. So it's just fantastic. I think it's a great button. Yeah. So that works with a link or a gang group as well. Um, and yeah, so I, what I was touching on was the offline software. You can obviously still uh, use this pressing the control button, I believe. Um, Fernando's got it there. He might be able to show us quickly. Yeah, let me show you that because in the offline software, as you say, I've got their optional button there. You can see, okay? Mm -hmm. And obviously there is, in the console, you, there is a menu which shows you what the short keys are, shortcuts, mm. okay? Uh, in this case, for what we're doing, the control key, as you can see on the keyboard, mm -hmm. we latch or we just uh, press and hold function to do the same thing we can do on the surface. So yes, we can do exactly the same thing we do on the surface in the offline. Well, just to mention, if anyone is following at home with the offline software, if you do need any help with any extra buttons, if you go to your system tab on the offline, you'll be able to find your keyboard help sort of uh, window. So make sure you double check that to find all of the offline instructions in terms of how you're operating the software. Okay, cracking. So that's the number one. Um, let's crack on to our second favorite thing. So first of all, global set to default. Now, this is a really, really useful function as well. I can affect a whole swathe of changes across all inputs, outputs, maybe looking at just aux outputs or group outputs, things like this. Fade this to zero dB, all EQs on, high pass filter, low pass filters on straight away. If you're an engineer that likes to have faders up at zero dB, bring levels in via the head amp gain, this is the function for you. Or maybe you are you know, teching a festival desk. Why not have all the EQs turned on to begin with? So when your guest engineer pops up, all they need to focus on is dialing in their mix, okay? Fernando, let's, uh, let's have a quick look at this. Um, where, where can we find the global set to defaults? Easy, Tom. Uh, I'm gonna show it first in the surface, and then as always, I'm gonna switch to my offline for a better view. As you can see there on files, I can reach, I can open files, and in that menu, I will find global set to default. If I press it, it will open it. Let me show you the view of that tab. And you can see that it tells you, it asks you what kind of channel you want to be working on. So I mm. want to be working on my input channels, for example. Or you can be working with your input channels and add your auxes, for example. And then you have the types of commands you want to apply to those channels. Mm -hmm. So let me show you what happens. For example, if I do, so I'm right there and I've got my faders. And for some reason, I want all my faders to 0 dB. Okay. Mm -hmm. Easy. I can just go to input. Yep. And then I can select faders to 0 dB. They all line up perfectly okay or i right. can go faders off or i can prepare my session with all my mutes on so yes it's right. a very quick way to reset parts of the console yeah exactly um now again that affects a whole suite of uh, information so all inputs or all outputs of a particular variety but of course we can go and default individual parameters on individual channels um now to do this we actually use the preset functionality uh, which is uh, available on your inputs and outputs presets are an amazing tool inside the desk you can save them separately from your session take your presets away with you on a separate memory stick convert them take them from session to session retaining all of the information that you've set up on inputs, outputs, so on and so forth. Fernando, how can we have a look at setting this up on an individual channel basis? Okay, Tom. So yes, we can affect individual channels. As you said, the global, it's obvious by, by its name, affects mm -hmm. the entire console. So if we want to do individual things, okay, what we're going to do is you can see here, 
Okay, I can go to any channel. I can open the channel and I've got my presets here. Then what you can do is you can select any of the modules here. For example, I just want to reset my gains. Okay, cool. So yeah, my yeah, gains. Yeah, trim. Yeah. Exactly. And you can see there all the settings. And when I press default to my first channel, there you go, it's gone back to zero. So Fantastic. extremely quick way to resetting individual channels without affecting the rest of them. Of course. Um, and then to take this one step further, because again, we can always develop our, our protocols inside our consoles, is to add this actually to a macro function, isn't it? Um, we can do this with the star functionality. Now, the star function um, is a very powerful tool in your macro uh, armory, so to speak, that will allow you to apply the macros settings to the last selected channel. So again, if you needed to set up a macro that will quickly reset gains, maybe EQs, you know, you've got different performers jumping in and out, the macro functionality is for you. Fernando, how can we go set that up again? All right, Tom, let me show you that, okay? As always, my general view, set up, I'm gonna open my macro menu, okay? Cool. Uh, you can see there, Got my macros. What I want to do today is I want to have a macro, okay, that is gonna capture, and that menu is one is another of my favorite things in this console. Mm -hmm. I can capture that I want to default. So let me do it. Capture. I want to default, and I'm gonna switch the console so people know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Preset, and I just want to. Reset the gain. Yeah, cool. And if you okay. wanted the EQ as well, you could add that in. But yeah. yeah, go for a gain reset. And as you can see, I have applied that to my channel 29, which is twice, but it doesn't matter. Okay. So the important thing, what you were mentioning, uh, this mm. is going to be applied to channel 29, but we have the star functionality okay Very important to remember it is yep. really cool so we can apply that we can put this on a on a macro so let me put it on a macro button easy let me take the capture off okay uh, so now what we got it's input channel 29 set the analog gain to zero but i don't want 29 i want that to be star so that means it's going to apply the macro to the active channel whatever that is so let me show you that in the surface, okay? So, as you can see here, I've got plenty of channels with gain, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna be just triggering my macro, and you see gain zero, gain zero, gain zero, gain zero. Or oh, I can apply that to the EQ or whatever. You know, this is a very exactly. quick way to uh, reset individual parameters. So it's great, yeah. I like it. And remember with the macros, you have many, many, many triggers. <laughs> so if you do run, o, uh, run out of your hardware triggers, the buttons or the smart keys, then you have plenty of other options, iPad app, F keys on your keyboard, so on and so forth. Okay, brilliant. So moving on to number three then. Our third favorite option is our control group faders, control aux sends. So you can really utilize this as a much quicker way of adjusting groups of signals being sent to your artist's mix. Using the control groups, you activate this option uh, within the options tab, so to speak, but essentially this will save you plenty of time from having to have all your fingers on all your faders uh, for adjusting mix positions and levels. Fernando, I think you've got some examples for us. Yes, I do. First thing, let me show you where you can find where to activate that, okay? So- well, good to start at the beginning. Yep, so we go to our options panel and on the faders tab, there you go, CG control aux sends, okay? That is now uh, set to no, which means that my VCAs are always controlling inputs, okay? Correct. All right, now I'm gonna switch it to yes, and let's see what happens. I'm gonna switch to my overview camera, and I've got a bank here, which has got a drum kit, then I've got my in-ear mix number one, let's say the bassist, and I've got a VCA or control group for my drum kit. Cool. Okay. So normally, 
what you would do, let me switch the function to off first. So if I do a sense on failure for that mix, that's the drum kit going to that auxiliary, as always. Yes. And my control group, which is here, has it moved, is still controlling inputs. It's nothing to do with sense, okay? Nope. The moment I go back to my offline and I say, okay, I want this functionality on, mm -hmm. when I do a sense of failure, look what happens to my BCA, or my control group. It drops to the mid position of the fader run. Cool. Why that? Because it's not affecting inputs anymore. It's affecting sense to that auxiliary. Let me show you that with a much detailed view. I think it's going to be great. So you can see here. Oh, there's a little friend again. Yeah. Ah, don't worry. And you can see that by moving my BCA, what I am doing is I am trimming actually it's a trim you plus are, yes. minus 18 db trim to the to the sense to that particular mix so it's just great once i go back to my normal my bca returns to the normal position which is controlling inputs again so what can i say it's just the monitor's engineer's uh, dream basically yep very good um the other option as well just to point out is if you don't have any control group uh, members sorry in your control groups, then when you activate this, you'll notice the control group faders will actually kind of turn off. So not to confuse you with uh, the plus or minus 18 dB trim activation, so to speak, okay? Um, nice. And back yeah, just, yeah, just remember it's a, it's a trim level. So every time you, you turn it on and off, it, it resets, okay? So it's plus or minus 18 dB every time you turn it on, okay? Brill, so number four, getting into our fourth one here. Macro fire snapshot for crossfades. Now this is a very much created tool in the armory. You can look to set this up to assist in transitions between snapshots or simply to queue in certain channels with a nice predetermined crossfade. Again, you can use triggers for this and we've got some pretty cool things to show. Uh, Fernando, what can we do with this function? Another thing that's going to speed up your uh, workflow pretty much. So let me show you. So what I've done here, if I've done one macro which is that one there. I'm going to open the editor. And you can see that we have on the left side, we have the command types. Mm -hmm. And one of them is the snapshot panel. On the snapshot panels, we have several commands. One of them would be fire snapshot number. In my case, I have uh, created a macro that fires snapshot number five. So when I go into my console and I fire my snapshot number five there you go snapshot five so that's one way to do it there's no mm -hmm. crossfades here still okay i have saved that part for this thing now that i want to yeah, show absolutely. you absolutely yeah yeah, yeah yeah so that's how you're recalling a snapshot on a macro is exactly that's just a yeah, recall yeah. part of it okay yeah. now i've got another snapshot which is the next one which has got some crossfades okay but I want to show it in a different way because we have used those buttons to fire the macro. Mm -hmm. Now I'm mm -hmm. going to make it a bit faster. So let's yeah. let's make an example. I am actually mixing and I've got my singer on my right, uh, right master fader. Okay, you so want to be riding that? Yeah, yeah you want that? I need, I need to yeah. be riding all the time. Okay, it's a very demanding artist. Okay. As, you know, as is yeah. tradition. Yeah. But this is extra demanding, so extra, I really extra. need to stay, <laughs> stay in here. And, but I still need to fire, at some point, a crossfade, okay? Mm. And what I've done is I have linked that mute button to the fire of the next snapshot. Let me show you how. Well, when I'm here in the offline, for my next snapshot, editor, there you go. What I have used is my fade start functionality yep. and is set to the mute. So what happens? Okay, I am riding the fader at any point. Let me close that so you can see how the snapshot changes. So I'm riding the fader at any point. I need to fire the crossfade, just reach the mute button, keep on mixing. And there you see there my cues and my faders are crossfading. So there's many things you can do and you can trigger macros and you can apply the crossfades by moving faders up and down or mute on, mute off, or the trigger buttons. 
fantastic. I mean, with the triggers as well, for all those snapshots on the faders and, and the mutes, um, you can have the on and off functionality as well. You can also have multiple channels to be in a similar positions for a macro to fire. So you could have a little control mechanism where you're bringing faders down, then on the last fader, the macro will fire, for example. So you can really tune this into specific installation needs or even just unique things you want to do on your tour or festival setups and things like this. So macro fire snapshots, cross crossfades, little used, little known about, but very, very useful just to assist in those transitions, which is cool. I really no, like it. It speeds it up is, a lot. Yeah. It is good. You know, just anything just to slightly tickle it and, and not have such a dramatic off to zero or something like that, you know, um, works really well. Number five, aux nodes. One input, too many outputs. Again, people are cottoning on to this. It has been around for a while now. <laughs> but um, essentially available under the layout tabs uh, under aux nodes. Uh, this is where you can also, by the way, uh, access the nodal processing on the quantum desks as well. So this is Indeed. how you're uh, accessing that. So if you need to send one signal to multiple outputs quickly, this is how you do it, Fernando. Yeah. Take it away. So again, on the layout menu, we've got aux panel, aux node, sorry, and that brings up that panel. We chose every send for a selected channel. Mm-hmm. It's important to know that sometimes it will be blank and that's just because you haven't selected a channel, okay? So, uh, there is a very similar view to that one, which I'm gonna mm -hmm. open on my left screen to explain the difference, okay? So basically this one here has only one rotary, which is the touch and turn control, common anything to all Anything on the of master them. screen, yeah, anything on the master screen, touch and turn rotary, that exactly, is your control. Exactly, exactly. So that, gives you the chance to do this. Select several sends at the same time, and who wants the hi-hat? I want, I want the hi-hat, I want, the, you know, you send the signal to all the mixes at the same time. Yes. You, you can still go here, and you can still adjust what you want, okay? So that, you essentially have like a global control on the right hand side and then on the left hand window, you can actually individually then adjust each mix position of exactly. that particular signal. Yes. And obviously this Rapid. will will keep the relative differences. And you have another button to make it single or you mm -hmm. can clear all the assignations. So just very fast to use. Exactly. And then, I mean, uh, yeah, I think just to point out as well, there's a sort of a, a, a dial or a text box where you can actually dial in a specific value. There is indeed, yes. Absolutely update everything to a zero dB value or something like this. Exactly, yeah. yes. No, cool. Um, so, yeah, just left hand window, one input to your outputs on an individual basis. And then on the right hand window, one input to multiple outputs with one control via the touch and turn. Awesome. Thank you for that. Now, moving on into number six, line check mode. Okay, so this very easy system, just specifically for your line checking, especially if you have inputs across your system that you're not actually have patched into the desk. So you just want to go and set head amp gains, things like this. Um, it's all done pre-processing, pre-gate and all this stuff as well. So all you're listening to is the raw kind of head amp gain signal as you are dialing it in. Extremely useful for festival setups, things where you need to have quick swapping and changes of IO racks. Um, but Fernando, uh, show us how it works. Take it away, boss. Yep. As you said, Tom, the gates can be a nightmare when doing line check. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is just, you know, a fantastic way to do a line check directly to the rack, basically. Mm -hmm. So let me show you that. I've opened the setup audio IO panel that shows the rack. I have connected to the console. Okay, one of them is the one I'm showing uh, is actually receiving audio, but it's not even patched to the console. Mm -hmm. uh, let me that I want to point that out because it's important because you can line check signals that are not in your session, mm -hmm. which is great. But anyway, yeah. so you can see there there is a button called line check, which by the way is not in the offline version. Yeah, for you can only do obvious reasons, yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. So when I press line check, and then I press any socket on screen, what I get is a full dialogue here, mm -hmm. where I've got the listen button, so I can listen to that signal through the PFL bus, either one or two, 
I can label the socket. It will tell me which channel is using it. If it is, mm -hmm. in this case, it's, it's blank because I'm not it's not using patched it. It's in not anywhere. patched yeah. in. So, okay. yeah, yeah. But I've got the Phantom as well, and then I've got the gain. So I can mm -hmm. just be doing like a, I got that, switch to another. I got that as a very, you know, bit low, put it up. Yeah, that one, that's too hot. Bring it down. Okay, so extremely quick way and easy to do any line check. And if you are on a different rack, such as, for example, a D2, yeah, it looks like a D2. Rack, yep. yeah, you can see that you will have the pad option well. available. Yeah. Okay. So oh, full, full control of the preamp without having to go into channels, routine mm -hmm. or anything. You can line check the rack directly. Just and love that Yeah, fantastic. And as soon as that is set as well, it's all stored, the data within the rack. So as soon as you patch it in, you're good to go. Uh, and your head amps are all set, leaving you guest engineer or indeed yourself enough time to sort out those levels for the first few songs. Anyway, um, so there's, <laughs> there is number six for you. Cool. Now, our seventh workflow enhancement tip the surface offline mode. Um, so this will allow you to edit on the fly. Uh, this is specifically used with the snapshots. Um, now I know nobody watching today has ever needed to double check anything in advance or edit a snapshot after you've just fired it thinking, oh, that could have been a bit better. But if you did, then this is the function for you. Okay, so taking the surface offline disconnects the engine from the work surface. Okay, then you can go back in time to previous snapshots, make any edits. So for your next gig, you don't need to worry about them as much or indeed go down future snapshots just to double check things if you need to. Fernando, where is the button for this? OK, Tom, I'm going to show you with my little helper here. There he is again. Where the surface offline is, OK? It's one of my favorite, this one. I really like it. OK, so let's see how it works. So I've got my snapshot panel and I'm running snapshot number one. And mm -hmm. uh, let's say I forgot, uh, I've got a guest artist coming in in snapshot number seven for the closing. So obviously what I would do is I would sweat a lot <laughs> because I forgot to add it to the session. But then I will, I will remember. Not. It's not like you. <laughs> <laughs> but I will remember there is a specific theme OK, so I will a specific functionality that help, will help me with that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave that button pressed. And it will start blinking. That means the surface is no longer connected to the audio. Mm -hmm. And that means I can now fire my last snapshot. OK, and I can do any changes to it. So fire that one and I need that down. OK. Mm -hmm. Update selected. So I have edited a future snapshot. Now I've got two ways to return to my original position. I can either press the button return to audio, mm -hmm. which will fire back the snapshot I am currently running in the background, which is number one. Yep. Or I can return to the, I mean, I can switch the surface offline and that will fire my the snapshot current. number seven, which I have just edited. Yep, yep. So in my case, I'm gonna go return to audio. You see that I have saved those things, but this is not gonna affect the audio. I'm gonna go back to where I was. Okay, let's prove it. I'm on gains. You see the changes have been saved. Yep, absolutely. And didn't affect the live audio. So no. one of them that I really, really enjoy playing with. It's very useful. Uh, I have seen this used in other instances as well. Maybe you get uh, a few little splashes of, of your local beverage uh, drop on a desk. Maybe it's a rocking gig, for example. You can actually use this function, get a little tea towel in between some. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned like that. it, Tom. Yep. Because uh, that's exactly what I did 10 minutes ago. Oh, right. <laughs> I set the sweet uh, surface offline and I gave it a good wipe. I did warn you before not to go spill that can of Diet Coke or whatever you're drinking over there. But, uh, you know, you can only give good advice. Whether it will be heeded is another thing. Um, so before you cool. carry on, do we have any? Yes, we have, oh, a, sorry, we have, a, we have a question from, uh, from Dory Music. Um, and I'm going to put it up on the screen here. And it's actually just going back to the line check mode that uh, Fernando was talking about. 
Um, and he would like to know if that is just for the line jet mode or does it affect the channel gain, socket gain as well? So uh, It does affect the channel. It's just a remote of uh, the channel gain, really. Absolutely. Actually, now that you mentioned that, that could be a good thing. So let's say you have a stereo channel mm -hmm. and uh, one of the outputs of the keyboard is lower than the other one. Uh, you can either patch those left and right signals to mono channels to compensate or just leave it as it is, go to the rack, switch the line check mode on and you can control each of the pre's separately. Perfect. A couple yeah. of things to add to that specific example as well. If you've got a stereo channel coming in, say from a synth or something, and you do have a dodgy left or right, we do have the duplicate buttons, which you can instantly duplicate the working non-grainy level across your stereo source. You can also use your multi-input channel, which actually is a very useful way of making mm -hmm. non-adjacent stereo channels and mm -hmm. actually will give you separate head amp gain control. So maybe on an overhead left and right setup, whereas a stereo channel, you might want to take a more direct feed from a unity gain value sort of thing like a stereo uh, keyboard or, or something like this for so, a straight um, answer to the gentleman yes it is just a remote of the gain on the channel yeah absolutely another useful thing for that actually because there's always just one more thing alternative inputs on your main uh singer's channel or whatever alternative input you're using Line check mode can allow you just to quickly set that separate head amp because remember, it doesn't copy the channel's head amp from one socket to another. They are two independent sockets. That so is a very good so. point, Tom. Hey, we are just full of them today. Um, <laughs> keep your questions coming in, obviously. Um, we are going through this. Lovely. So number eight, our eighth favorite thing, mapping to rotaries. So often overlooked, um, and I've had some classic examples of users uh, needing multiple functionalities, which this actually allowed you to do. Um, so parameters on screen, all mapped to rotaries for your, your quick access, so to speak. Um, Fernando, show us how this can be done. Um, because again, it's just one of those little things where, where people aren't too familiar with it. I don't think many people know. I mean, yeah, so obviously. I mean, people know. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, no that is, is, it's one of them things that is underused, in my opinion, as well. Okay, yeah, just like the optional button. Mm. So let me show you, okay. I'm working with an SD12 today, right? Uh, that means I've got the quick select buttons, mm -hmm. which will map any uh, module to the top row of rotaries, okay? That means uh, I can just easily switch, as you can see there, and it will mm -hmm. follow. But then to the right of each of the rows, I've got the selection button. Okay, and an LCD telling you what it is. Okay, so what I can do is if I leave that one pressed and I touch on screen what I want, for example, the compressor, mm -hmm. there you go. I can map anything from the, uh, from screen onto the rotaries. The cool thing, Tom, is that this will be remembered by bank. So my bank number one, that's my yep. compressor. Or my bank number two, that I want it to be my filters, for example. So you cool. can see. Uh, or, for example, a very common use would be to put always the gains on here. Yeah, absolutely. Because that's your sound check mode, then, yeah. isn't it? You can have your pan on the top, you've got your gain at the bottom because let me remember show that you that. Rotary is always changing. So let so me patch you, yeah. 12 channels. Okay. Now I can go here and I can say map this row to the gains. That's awesome. it. And now I can keep on switching whatever I want for the top and row. Go down to your pans. Just and so always I can see it. Yeah. And I pan there. Okay. So that's a pan. And I have always access to the game, which is very important. That's good. The hint or lit feedback feature is good as well. Um, There's another sort of similar function, isn't there? It's a, it's a global quick select, isn't it, on, on the options menu? Just yes. go over that quickly so everyone yes, can yes, see. Yes, there the is, because you're right. Uh, as I said, the those uh, mappings will be remembered by bank. Correct, yeah. As well as the quick select uh, uh, button as well. Functions, okay. yeah. So that can be confusing or that can be useful. It's up to the show, up to the engineer, okay? But exactly. just so everybody knows, I'm going to show that probably in the offline, which is going to be a bit more sharp. Let me mm -hmm. see, okay. 
So what we want to do is we want to go to the surface and set global quick select to yes. And that means that it doesn't matter what bank you're in, it will keep the selection. Your quick select will always be exactly. uh, assigned to each bank, essentially. Yes, yes. Yeah, cool. So just to point out as well, with the mapping of the rotaries function on Quantum 7s, um, SD8s, SD10s, even SD7s, um, you have three rows of rotaries. So you can utilize all three rows for your user-defined layer, your user-defined functionality. But equally, if you're looking to get the talkback uh, function, which you can utilize from our AUX outputs, and actually on broadcast software on every single input and output, um, you will need to map this to your rows of rotaries in just the way Fernanda has shown you to actually gain access to the talkback feature. Okay, So that will be on all the desks that have three rows of rotaries, primarily because they don't have the quick select button on the side of the screen. Okay, So take that away of you, and uh, that's how you're getting your talkback on those particular desks. Cool. So moving on into the ninth. Now, this is a cool one, um, and I think it probably will solve a few questions uh, or answers even. Gate links versus key inputs. Let's have a, let's have a quick chat about this. Yes. Fernando, um, let me show you. What, what, would you, what would you suggest the, the main purposes of using either or functions are for? All right, Tom. Uh, well, we all know the sidechain, what the, the sidechain does is allows a gate to open depending on someone else's level, basically. Correct. Yeah, but, exactly. And you keep your own settings. So you still have your own attack and release settings that's mm -hmm. unique to your gate. So you could have a lead singer keyed in with a backing vocal, but the backing vocal has their own gate settings. For example, okay. Exactly. But uh, the link button you are mentioning, mm -hmm. which is this one here for the gate, okay? Yep. It's different because it, what it will do is it will link all the parameters of one gate to the other. So for example, I can link that top channel the top microphone of the snare with the bottom one. Cool. So the bottom one will not open until mm -hmm. the top one does. And, and there will be face lock. Ah, that's what I was just about to ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it basically locks in the same uh, settings of the gate from, say, the top and bottom sort of uh, mic settings, so to speak. Exactly. So it's just, it clears up a lot of the spilling in a drum kit. I mean, you can. You can apply it to anything, really, but that's just an example I thought quickly. Yeah, I think it works really well. And if you're often wondering how those punchy sounds are made actually from, from your snare sounds on DigiCode, that's one of the useful tools that a lot of engineers do actually use because, again, it's just utilizing the same settings on the other microphone that you've got linked. And specifically for that example, I think you can have chosen a better example, Fernando. So, uh, no, carry on with those. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Cool. So moving on up into our 10th feature. So the audio enhancer. That's one of my favorite times. You know that one. <laughs> uh, I think it is. I mean, this is, a, this is an effect that if you know, you know, you know, sort of one of those ones. It's uh, <laughs> works really well. So, um, so essentially what it does is it will split your input signal into your three primary bands, high, mid and low. Each band will have specific processing applied to it to enhance that particular band. So a bit more detail. Your high frequency possess three bands, splits into two paths. The first is simply a mix to your high frequency path. The second subband creates additional harmonics. The mid frequency maintains the overall spectral integrity of your signal. So basically you can add a DigiTube uh, process to this to generate your second and third order harmonics when driven, so drive that signal into the tube. The low band is essentially a limiter, but also splits into two paths, a bit like the high frequency, one mix and one compressor. It uses dynamic attack and release to add to the transient punch in that bottom end. So if you've ever used this on a drum bus, for example, and there's one bit of homework that you all should do, put an audio enhancer on your drum bus or in fact, anything that you need to spice up your mix with, it will sound amazing. Fernando, how can we set this up and put it into our mix? Okay, Tom. So uh let me show you on my general view what i've done which is i've got several in ear mixes here okay and i've just inserted them okay so on my insert point i've mm -hmm. got my audio enhancers i'm going to show you here which looks a little bit better 
And as you mentioned, I can see the three bands here. I got the low yep. compress, which is the low band. I got I see the mid band with the amount of tube emulation we want exactly. to add. We have a, a crossover, okay, that you can set to the right frequency. And then we have the driving of the high frequencies, which will add harmonic content to it. I yep. have to say, this, uh, this is a jaw dropper. If you know what I mean. I mean, yeah. once you hit it, it, it changes your life. <laughs> it does indeed. Um, and I'm very passionate that about those things, me. you know. Tom. <laughs> yes, I know what you're like when you're passionate about something, Fernando. So, um, but please don't let me stop you. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, I mean, it's a fantastic effect unit. You can use uh, many of them within the internal library. Um, you know, if, if you want to bring out stuff in the high frequency, you know, play with the drive and the boost. And when you get that balance, it really makes your mix breathe. You know what? I like it a lot, Tom, space. on a drum right. bus. Yes. I really like it. You know, you can try it out. Do not EQ anything. Just insert it on a bus. Mm -hmm. And it it, it, it really sh it's shocking how yeah, good it is. It's just a little tiny detail there of all that amazing processing that we have underneath the hood. Um, and again, Audio Enhancer has been with us for many, many years. So yep. but start using it in your daily workflow. Um, you won't be disappointed. <laughs> okay. Yep. So number 11, fader touch assignment. So hardly used sometimes, but when setup of uh, quick bus buses is required, um, you can use this for mix minus buses within seconds, essentially, things like this. Fernando, show us uh, how this is accomplished. Well, the thing, Tom, is that not many people know that you can use your hands uh, on faders to do some selections or deselections. Oh, sorry, sorry. I thought you, I thought you were making a joke. Uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to prove it like with a sort of a mix minus one example. So we've got yeah. the Orbit track outside the festival. They are sending all the adverts with all the music. You are mixing it in and you need to send them a fallback. OK, uh, obviously you need to leave out their own channel. So you can either go and start sending channels to the group, except the one you are receiving from them, mm -hmm. or you can use your fingers. So let me show you that. I'm going to go to group number five. Cool. Okay. On group number five, you can see I've got a clear all, select or join all. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use the join all function, but I'm going to leave one finger on channel number one, just on top, just touching the fader. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go join all. Okay. Let me hit the down. Let me do it here. Yeah, join all. And I show you now in the console how it's added all the channels at once. Mm -hmm. Lots of them. Except for the one I was touching. Exactly. So if you need to send a, a mix That's back to whoever's sending it to you, <laughs> just that leave, is the best yeah, way to do it. Yeah, yeah. Leave the finger on top of the fader, press join all. That's it. And it works the other way around. So if I press several channels here, those yep. ones, for example, and then I go to clear all, those are the ones who would remain on the bus. So it's an extremely quick way to do mix minus one or a bit more complex uh, at center mm -hmm. groups. Um, and even from just a kind of overview point of view if you have that function on every time you kind of tap on a fader on the channel strip itself you'll always see a little highlight a little identification just to show you on screen which channel you're also sort of controlling you know you can never have too much indication yeah, of what, feedback what you're doing important. yeah all good all good how are the questions doing uh dan and molly how uh yeah, have we got any? it's all good actually i do have a question for you which goes back to something that uh, fernando was just talking about um so a question from Dakota that says, uh, is there a way to reset the rotary assignments back to default? And I guess actually this might be joined in with some sort of custom layout sort of type, type question. Something you could talk about maybe for a minute? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, from a default point of view, sorry for another, let me jump in there. Um, from a default point of view, your bottom row of rotaries is generally always your pan. Um, and then the idea is they are completely uh, flexible, flexible, uh, <laughs> flexible. You can choose which parameter that you want to assign. So they're user defined essentially. 
the bottom row anyway. The top row on the SD12, as Fernando showed, that will change with your quick selects. Uh, but basically, I would thought that resetting that would just be putting the pan where it was. Exactly. And that yeah. is how the console starts always. The pan at the bottom, quick select on top. Cool. Um, and I believe if you press that button again, it can, can go back to your auxes as well on the other desks that have the three rows of rotaries yes. as well. So uh, just to keep those things fresh for your mind, just look at your different work surface layouts according to what desk that you are using. Everything is flexible and you can put one thing, uh, apply one thing from one desk to another. But obviously, there'll be some minor differences in the hardware layouts and things like this. OK. Um, yeah, I mean, again, with the mapping of the rotaries, you've got your custom banks, you know, build your custom banks. And then again, you can always go back to, say, your drum bank or your vocal bank, and you'll always have those specific thresholds for your comps assigned or your gates assigned, ready to go. OK, and again, with Digico, it's all about finding your own flow, how you like to mix, because you can do anything you want on these desks. Um, and hopefully some of the things that you're seeing today is uh, just adding to that desire to get back in front of one. So, number 12, uh, the hard mute. Um, now, again, another snapshot function. It's a good way to keep certain channels from unmuting themselves due to automation. Um, Fernando, how, uh, how can we set this up? Okay. So, Tom, we've got several mutes in our consoles, okay? Uh, specifically, we have three. We have the normal channel mute. We have a hard mute, which, as you said, will not be included in the automation and then we have a control group mute uh, to access this uh, the hard mute what we do i'm going to do some mutes that's just normal mutes yes and to that's your input channel mute yeah that's, yeah exactly uh, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the bottom of your channel basically yeah, yeah and they will follow the automation that's the important part okay mm -hmm. but now if i press the second function Every time I mute, I will get this nice blinking mute telling me it's a hard mute. So mm -hmm. it will stay like that throughout the list of snapshots. It will never change. That is great. But it can be, it's very theater related. Maybe our host Dan can uh, give us a hint on what you use it for in theater. Absolutely. So, uh... You know, these rock and roll sessions may run to 10, 20 snapshots uh, in theatre. Uh, we're into several hundred snapshots and they will generally have a, a dedicated RF tech to deal with the, you know, the radio packs and all the things. Um, and with all that sort of fast changing snapshot stuff, being able to hard mute a channel and not worry that the snapshot system is going to unmute a channel while they change batteries, change a pack or whatever. Um, so mm -hmm. it's a really just a great way of isolating a channel um, when you have a lot of snapshots and a lot of automation stuff going on because you don't have to worry that it's gonna gonna become part of another system. So uh, well, Dan, I'm a rock and roller myself. <laughs> so uh, one thing I do like is that. Let me show you for rock and rollers. In the options, there is a disable menu, and hard mute is in. It's one of them. Okay. Uh, so you don't get confused if you don't running automation, uh, you just disable that and it will never let you. Yeah, down. absolutely. Because remember that you have to second function um, to activate the mute to, to get hold of the hard mute. But equally, second function will allow you to change the send points of your aux positions. Um, so if you are doing monitors and you're running through your aux send rotaries, you've got second function turned on. You're just going through setting particular things to pre-fade, post-fade, pre-mute, whatever you're doing. You're going down to mute particular channels. You don't want to keep hard muting that particular channel. So by disabling this in the options menu, you don't have to worry about the second function affecting the mute on your normal session. And Tom, okay. another way to get around this would be to, just in case you don't want to disable the button, mm -hmm. you want to be sure you're not setting your hard mutes without knowing it, it's just set the auto cancel second function time for, I don't know, five <sighs> seconds. So you are sure that your second function never stays on. Yeah, I think that's um, a very useful thing to always actually have turned on on the options menu or cancel second function. Also, I think it's the global uh, second function as well. Um, yes, there is one. Yes. 
So if you turn this on, I don't know if you can show everyone where that is, because they're quite close to each other, I think, aren't they? Yes. Um, if you so, have the global second function turned on, it then means if you turn it on on one particular work surface, you can then turn it off anywhere else on the work surface. Okay? And I do like that, Tom, especially when you have three screens and all. OK, but yes, as you know, as you can see here, if I now switch the second function, it will go on also for my right bank. So yeah. I can switch it on and off from any bank just makes it easier. Yeah, great, nice. So that is the uh, the hard mute, okay. Uh, and... Fantastic, I'm just gonna jump in, Tom. I've got a question for you guys. Yes. Um, from uh, from Scott, who would like us, and it goes back again to something we were saying earlier, so he's been paying attention. Uh, he would like to know how to save, if we could show him how to save presets to a stick and where you, know, where you, where you load and save your preset files to uh, USB sticks. Always a good thing to know especially after we've chatted about it. <laughs> um, so files and then save your presets. I think Fur can show us where that is, isn't it? Yes, of course I can, Tom. I have my offline here and you can see the save presets there. Mm -hmm. Bear in mind, all our libraries are consolidated in a single file. Okay, so then you just need to go here, save presets, go to your USB key, save it and load it in any console. Yeah, pretty much. Um, so it's just a sense, create the preset first of all, obviously. Um, go into your inputs, you know, do your new preset, and then you'll actually have the data to save, and then go into that save presets window. Um, and again, like I was mentioning, have your presets memory stick. You can have your session memory stick. You take your, your, your presets around with you and uh, keep all your amazing setups on that 10 or 15 mic drum kit that you had to do <laughs> so just in case it comes around again you got your preset ready not only so. that tom we even have we even have mix uh presets for auxes mm. which is great because you can save your balances so exactly. I, got, I got i'm gonna uh, have a show with the same drummer again mm -hmm. and i know he likes this balance okay so as a starting point yeah i mean why not yeah and yep. while, we're, while we're on the subject of the loading and saving, um, Dennis has asked about you know, loading show files maybe in a festival situation. So I think maybe partial load might come in here. Uh, it might be a good thing just to, to bring up yep. and show how we can filter the load process. Absolutely. Um, again, you know, going to the festival can be tricky. You know, you have to get a sort of compromise and run the festival crew patching and, and stuff like this. And you want to just be able to quickly bring in your guest engineer's input information straight away. Um, Fernando, you are well versed, I believe, with your okay. So, yeah, let me... experience that you have there. Um, now, well, to demonstrate. the thing, yeah, the thing is that uh, that's we do that a lot in the Montreux Jazz Festival every year. So basically, every time an engineer pops around our office, we have an office there. They will bring their session, and we will partially load it into the festival session that contains all the macros and all the things they need to have. Bear in mind, it's a very serious festival and they even have macros for the EVAC. So yeah. they have to use their template. What we do is we go to the, uh, we load the session of the festival and then we go to the load session menu, select the new one, go to the partial load and select how many inputs we want to load into the, or merge. Let's call it merge because it's a merge. merge. Okay. In, uh, with a festival session. The next thing we will do, and probably somebody will ask this, is we will create one snapshot. We will save all the gains and the patch because we don't know what rack the session was created with. And we can just, let's call it, print the gains in our festival racks easily. Yeah, so that's the other thing that we can cater for, um, and especially the combination of a partial load and your snapshot system that can save you, well, tens of minutes, which we all I'll, know is invaluable time. <laughs> normally, I would say uh, we can get up, that up and running within uh, five minutes. Exactly. Five to ten minutes. If, if less, you know, it's um, it's very, very quick um, and efficient in the way that you do it. So if you just go back into the partial load window, because um, you can actually set um, ranges of inputs and outputs as well, can't you? So say, for example, if you had 10 mics on, on stage that you don't want to change from your current setup, you know, you can then put from inputs 11 to 48 from your uh, uh, from your source session, so to speak, can't you? It can oh, really okay. allow you to define certain yeah. things. As you can see there, I can, yeah, I can leave channels one to 10 fixed. 
let's say we are using we are sharing the drum kit for example for all the band this is a small heavy metal festival and they're all sharing yeah, the drum yeah. kit and why loading those channels if it's all good for example so yeah, yeah it will also allow you to merge snapshots or even macros which is great okay there's always some fiddling i mean there's always obviously some things that you will need to set up but it's a yeah, very quick absolutely. way to merge sessions yes yeah Ruby. So I hope that answers uh, that question. Any others coming in there, Dan? Absolutely. So uh, this is a question from Burton. Let's just put that up on screen. Uh, it says, hello, guys. Thanks for this. What's the best way to do any parallel compression? I guess using either waves or internal compressors. So this is an audio workflow uh, question, really. Exactly. Um, parallel bus compression. You want a, a, a dry and a, and a wet signal, basically, being fed to two separate buses, essentially. Um, yeah, you can set this up in the old school way. You can also use the new uh, rotary mix control that we have on the mustard processes on all the new compressors that we have there. So we actually have this blend rotary now. So don't need to worry about your parallel busing. You can literally just do it on the rotary, which is awesome. Um, Fernando, have you got anything uh, else? And in, in fact, you know, can yep, suggest, I can, uh, suggest a I can uh, quickly yeah. yep, can quickly go to my surface. Cool. I'm going to bring a lovely pink noise to my channel mm -hmm. and I'm not gonna send it to the master okay yeah. so on my busing I will switch the master off now the thing is the thing you need to be worried about it's uh, latency when you do parallel processing okay so you have to make sure your signal takes the same time to go either through one of the paths okay so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send my noise to five and six for example mm -hmm. so my groups five and six are here and i can see i've got the same signal in both because they are being fed to different buses but the same block length is applied latency is not an issue correct and yeah. then because our compressors do not add any latency to the system nope not at all yep switching one on will give you the balance dry wet as you say, this is a conventional way to do it. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you're using waves, there are plugins that have dry and wet or master, as you mentioned. Mm. So okay. the, the new mustard features on the quantum desks will eliminate potentially the need, but equally there's something satisfying about releasing that compression on a fader, isn't there? Uh, <laughs> and then when you need to, there, yeah, so you can actually you can still right do that. It. You can still well, do exactly, that. Well, exactly, exactly. But you know, it's the we old, you know. We give you both worlds, you choose. DJ World as well, isn't it? Faders or Rotary Blend, who knows? But anyway, so <laughs> um, hopefully that answers. Again, if you want any more questions answered, please keep firing away. Um, any more before we just uh, no, I think go back to what we're doing? Do you want to carry on with uh, your content and see where we yeah, go? Yeah, no worries, grand. So where do we get to? Lucky number 13. Um, lucky for some, anyway. That is the auto solo function, okay? So this is a really good way to have certain channels going to your solo buses uh, when any other channel is soloed, um, particularly if you have the boss's boss, i.e. The, the boyfriend or the girlfriend of the lead singer who wants to be able to you know, listen to everyone at the same time as, as the artist sort of thing. So, Fernando, how are we setting this up specifically with the auto solo function to begin with? Okay, so this uh, 12 plus 1 uh, feature, because uh, I haven't got salt, so I can't pronounce that number. <laughs> Okay, I can show you my surface there. If you go to the channels, maybe it's a bit better if I just go on the offline for a bit more clarity. Mm -hmm. So you see that Clara, when I Clara. open the panel, just under the solo, there is an mm -hmm. auto solo button. There is one pair bus, per solo bus, okay? And also on our console, on our solo panel, in the middle, there is a list. Let me show you that in the offline again. So there you go. There is a list for the autos, for the channels included in the auto solo mode. Okay, and you can enable it or disable it. But what it does is what we want to know is that it creates a link. So every time I do any solo, it brings those channels with it. So that can be the director, that can be the tool manager, mm -hmm. that can be the, the barman. Yep. And that can be, uh, as you said, the singer's girlfriend who wants to be telling you what's wrong. 
<laughs> could be the uh, yeah, or the mother, the father. You yeah, know, yeah, <laughs> my son is not loud enough. Okay, the and got more invested in in that particular future than the son or the daughter. There anyway, are other sorry, ways to do this, Tom. I mean, this is very quick. You can yep. use uh, you can just use the auto solo, but you it's can also use yeah. yeah. The solo bus becomes an input to the matrix. Both though, so yep, yep. you can also do bit more complex configurations by adding the two solo buses to the matrix and mix them with microphones or channels. Yeah, so right. it becomes a, a massive uh, communication system, a really good one. Ah, great, great. And yeah, that, that matrix system, any input can be patched into the, into the matrix system. And again, they are additional buses to your channel counts, your bus counts inside your session. Um, and yeah, specifically, yeah. Use them yeah. for your uh, sort of solo matrixing systems, which you can also set up. Cool. Um, so happy to crack on into our number 14. Copy from slash two and the little known stay open button. Um, again, a lot of you might have just gone, oh, I was told about that and I forgot about it. It's very simple to find, but it will probably uh, resolve much of your issues about the copy to from window disappearing. Uh, Fernando, can you show us where that is? It's one of them that I really, really like. And when I am demoing the system and I go to that thing, the people go like, oh dear. Every time, yeah. every time. <laughs> so let and me show I'm not you. naming any names of people that should know better either. So, <laughs> so let me show <laughs> Which you. Which is probably all of us at some point, so no worries. <laughs> I am gonna set up a channel here. I'm gonna use the AQ because probably you guys can see from home Mm -hmm. all the changes I'm doing a lot better. So you can see that queue there, okay? Uh, in case you need more, I can show it here as well. Okay, there you go. That's the queue I've set, okay? Thanks. And I am going to use, in the console, because I'm gonna do it across the surface, mm -hmm. the copy button. So I got my copy to there, and I might copy from. I'm gonna yep. open copy to. So, and I'm going to show as well in here so people can see. Okay, I've opened my copy too. Mm -hmm. And normally what you, what you would do is you would use the LCD solo buttons to select which channel you want to copy that parameter exactly. to. Uh, but obviously when you do that, and let me show you in the surface, every time I do that, I want to copy that channel here. It copies it, copied. but it collapses. Okay. And then, okay, copy two again to this other channel. Okay. There's there's the, the angle. That there is a button here called stay open. That people probably hasn't hasn't seen. And it is great because what it does is this. Copy two, stay mm -hmm. open, and I wanna copy it here, here, I wanna copy it here, here, here. I can change banks and it will stay open. I wanna copy there. And even I can go there. Okay, so that's an input okay, yeah. here. <laughs> there, there, there. So stays open all the time. You can copy across. It's just so much simpler. Yeah, absolutely. And again, you have that ripple root function at the top. So if you did want to copy uh, your EQ or whatever you have in your scopes, multiple channels in a row, use the ripple root function. There's also one thing I always want to just point back when we go to that copy to from window. Can you just go back into that window for? Sorry, Tom, I've got no audio. <laughs> okay. Can you go back into you type the it on a message? Yeah, can you go back into the window? Daniel? I think we've uh, we've lost Fernando on the audio side actually. Ah, oh, interesting. Fair enough. So as long as my dulcet tones can uh, keep you entertained, <laughs> then that is all Good. Um, so what I actually wanted to mention was the copy to from window. Um, there is a little, uh, what can I say, display. And it's actually of the SD7 setup. So it'll always show you like this LCD window with the buttons that you need to press. Um, basically, ignore that. You don't need to worry about that because that is just referring to what is on the SD7 regarding that. So that's just the copy from and copy to windows. OK, um, so we're going to have a bit more content to go through. I mean, we're going to be looking at probably a bit of switching racks in between uh, snapshots as well. So again, 
from a festival point of view, it's important um, to be able to confidently go between your SD racks back into your D2 racks or vice versa. And also to importantly retain the patching, the gains, the output patching as well from what you've got on your session coming into your current session, so to speak. Um, so hopefully my voice is now getting back through to the old Delgado. Panda, yes, can you hear us yes, yet? I can hear you perfectly okay. now. So we're just going to have a quick look at the old switching of the racks. Okay. Um, potentially looking at the snapshots. Um, so I what am... are we looking at and what, what do we need to do? I'm glad you're asking that because I came ready, so I did my homework. Good. So you know, let me show probably you. the first time you've ever done it. So yeah, I yeah, it. <laughs> yeah. My, I'm Spanish. I invented the word lazy. Hey, come on, okay. you know, mañana, mañana, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's do it today. So Good. okay, so what I've got here on my setup audio, uh, as you can see, maybe it's worth showing it also in the offline. Um, uh, well, this is all the racks I've got, okay? You won't see anything connected to it because it's the offline, but yeah. I've got a D2 rack connected in Muddy, mm -hmm. okay? And I have two SD racks connected on Optical. Uh, optical. Um, mm -hmm. What I want to do today is I want to switch my D2 rack to an SD rack, okay? Some people will make the mistake of adding a port. I was going to say the first thing that a lot of, uh, I guess, just if you're jumping straight into it, adding a port and thinking that it's going to add that previous information to that brand new port. That's not necessarily correct, is it, Fernando? No, no. So the best thing to, uh, the most important thing to look at, and uh, it's, uh, you see the port number here, mm -hmm. that's also on the channel patch so everything you are going to do when you need to switch rack just make sure you stay on the same port mm -hmm. okay. so in this case what i'm going to do i've got my d2 rack there and today i'm not working on madi i'm on optical okay so the first thing i'm going to do is i'm going to go to my connections mm -hmm. and i'm going to disconnect the madi one because i'm not using madi one of course okay then i'm going to go to my rack and I'm going to uh, change it to an SD rack. Because be, but because I don't know what's going to happen. Well, I do know, but let's imagine I'm the engineer. Yep. I'm going to make sure that I can recall my gains. Mm -hmm. Okay. For that, I will include the analog and the trim gains uh, on the global scope. Yep. And remember that if you don't press on the actual audio I tab there you might need to go in and select on individual racks to actually recall them so make yep. sure that they're, they're they're globally ticked exactly okay? so globally that's all yep. done and now i'm going to create a snapshot insert new and i'm going to call it gains mm -hmm. and patch patch okay done cool. so i've got okay. my snapshot gains and patch and now i can go to that view and i can change the rack to the nasty rack obviously that's gonna go blank because i didn't set the connection first which i could have mm -hmm. but I didn't on purpose just so we can yeah of course yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and this now i do the training as it is that's so great yeah, now okay. this rack is connected to the optor id number 11 so in a minute we will see some things happening and now it's asking me to conform the rack but obviously that's lost the patch mm -hmm. and the game mm -hmm. all i gotta do now is to go back to my snapshot, fire that snapshot again, okay, fire, and there you go. I can see my gains in there again. I can see my patch in there. So, Perfect. Quick. That is literally the way to do it. Thank you. <laughs> sometimes um, you want to do. Sometimes you want to do that uh, using presets, Tom. I was just going to say why. Let's let's have a quick look into that. Um, to be honest, it's a preset. We know how to recall a preset. What would be interesting, I think, for everyone to see is actually how to do a multi-channel preset. So say channels 1 to 48 or 56 and how you can actually do a multi-channel preset from that point of view. OK, let me show you that. All right. So uh, Go to in uh, you want, yeah, I'm going to do it from the channel list. OK, is that all right, Tom? Perfect. Perfect. I a like different it. way of doing it. So I like it because all the channels are consecutive. 
Okay, mm -hmm. I don't have to deal with uh, channels in different places of the surface. So what I can do is I can go to my bank number one, and this is something I can show here probably better. I go to my channels and I can uh, go to my edit mode. Okay, press on the channel and I've got my presets here. So all I need to do is to create a preset by pressing new and dialing the number of channels I want to include on that preset. For example, today I want 48 channels, which is my entire front of house mix. Yeah. Okay. And that's it. And now can the good thing about using presets is that sometimes in festivals, uh, the patch will not be your own patch. You will have to follow a different patch from one to 48 consecutive. There is no crossings. Mm. So this is a very uh, good way to quickly recover your patch or adapt your patch to a festival. Cool. Yeah. I think you're still on the offline. Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, very much so. Um, and again, it saves from the channel that you start the preset on from, so to speak. Okay, so because you did it on channel one to 48, it will save all 48. If you started it on channel 10, then obviously you have to go up to 58 to save the next 48 sort of channels from that point of view. Okay, yeah. how are the questions looking? We're still good, actually. Uh, Molly's been busy in the background answering away and doing some typing, so I think for the, uh, for the time being, everything is good. Good, good. Cool, so moving on to our next one the excitement of all of this is made me forget what number we're on um we're now going to have a look at the optical diagnostics window um so just a, just a, a chat through really how you can analyze things from the diagnostics window which is actually within the system tab of the desk okay so things that it can help you with you know identifying offline nodes little status uh, for your loops um Again, Fernando will be able to show us in real time. So yes. uh, let's have a look at what this uh, can show us. And for this, Tom, I am going to need the help of my little helper. OK, so let me grab it. Because called upon a few times today. <laughs> because that is my magic optical setup window. And I just love it because it doesn't depend on your session, which is mm -hmm. great. So you just uh, connect racks before you have even loaded your session, and you yeah. can see their detected devices. So I can see here all the IDs I'm working in with. Uh, so my console is ID number one, and I've got three racks, IDs 11, 12, and 24. I can see versions. And the important thing, Tom, I can see if the loop is broken, okay? Yeah. So let me see if I can go around and show you that. I'm gonna break the loop and I'll be back to show you, okay? Yeah, Just go cool. with me for a sec. Yeah, no worries. So again, within that system tab, you've also got other useful things, for example, your security setting. So if you were having to go away from the desk for a while, you can actually go and lock the desk down under the security tab. The other really cool thing about that tab is you can actually put sort of a user security permission. So you can set up your session, maybe it's for an installation or you have your part-timers coming in at the weekend that need to push a fader up or two. You can actually set up your session, lock it in a live mode where, for example, all they could potentially be doing is pushing faders up and turning mutes on and off, not dialing into the audio IO window, changing rack configurations or anything like this. So that's within the system tab. That is the security window. So that's very useful to set. Just don't forget your password. No, I'm joking. If you do forget your password, there is a, a reset. Give our support team a ring. Support at digiconsoles.com or us-support at digiconsoles.com for further info. Oh, Tom. Are, we, uh, are we unplugged a, a rack yet? Uh, yeah, because uh, let's say I have big large system i got 14 racks um mm -hmm. for some reason i've got that there's a problem with the optical loop okay. well if you have 14 racks in a theater and you have to check all of them by the time you finish the show is done it's not ideal is it no. <laughs> okay <laughs> so the good thing about that is that as you can see there this you just go into find the uh the notes you go go into the window there you go as in switch the camera? Yes, true. There we go. So if you go, yeah, sorry about that. 
Okay, you can see that my IDs 1 and 11 are not communicating. So it's an extremely quick way to find two nodes not talking to each other. Cool. And when setting up large systems, that, that, that is great. That, trust me, it is a great tool. No, no, very, very good. Um, and equally, that little ERR will also notify you if there is an actual no loop connected. So the audio will continue to work because it's mm -hmm. bi-directional. And that's the beauty of the optical system. Um, a redundant audio loop connected via optics. It's, uh, it's really efficient with auto-conforming and auto uh, uh, sort of... Uh, so every time stuff I like go, so. Tom, and I have to set up a system, mm -hmm. that is opened in every console. Yes. So I can go around and make sure that all the devices are connected and everybody mm -hmm. can see everything. So remember, you can have, you know, five redundant mixes as well as 14 racks on one of your optic loops. And each desk can have two loops. So you can do the numbers, 1,008, if you needed a hand there, of channels of potential audio you can be having throughout your Digico systems. Okay. Cool. So, how are the questions looking, Dan? Because uh, we are there or thereabouts, I think actually really. We're, uh, we're just about there, and I think it uh, might be time to start wrapping this up, Tom. Yeah, fantastic. Mm. Um, like I was saying at the very beginning, um, this is a sort of a new direction, a new little show that we are doing, and I think it's been really good. It's been great to actually host it for everyone viewing and uh, uh, signing in today. Uh, Fernando, any, any comments on our lovely viewers out there? I'm just waiting for the next one. I can't wait to see them all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, again, we have some incredible content coming up, as always, as we have been doing um, for the past few weeks, and we'll endeavour to do for the future weeks as well. We have our Fridays Ask Us really really good um they're the legend as he is um so anything else to add fernando everything i'm just i'm telling you <laughs> i can't wait to have the next one i want to be here again and uh, i'm so excited about sitting with you to find the next 10 cool things we can show absolutely and as always if there's anything that you would like us to cover please feel free to just yeah, email us text email us, us. Yeah. I'll give you fernando's number no i won't i won't do that uh, <laughs> <laughs> he can deal with all the questions and the fan mail can go to him anyway so uh, it's, it's all good um but it's a good goodbye from me and it's goodbye from me yeah i'm from me and we've been me. rehearsed a bit as you can tell <laughs> fine Awesome. Take care, right. everyone. Thanks, Stay everyone. safe, wash your hands, and take care. Stay safe.